Many works of Western literature retrace the exploit of magnificent military heroes. Reading them, well, I often question myself on the existence of exploit of African military heroes. Although the post-independence African literature has paid great attention to the military phenomenon, it has had a relatively little interest in the war itself. And speaking of the military, African writers have evoked the wicked more than the heroes. It's like an antagonism has developed between writers and the military, with the exception of liberation fighters in Northern and Southern Africa. Even a liberation poet like Dennis Brutus from South Africa has ambivalent feelings about boots, bayonets and belts. We can therefore ask ourselves two questions. Why are there so few literary works on military heroism in post-colonial Africa? And so, why are there so many works about the villainy? Hello everyone and welcome to this Sankofa flight today, the first of a two-part series into the heart of post-independence African literature. African History Daily by my daddy The absence of works on heroism is not due to the absence of heroes. The women and men who died bravely for the cause they defended in the African wars since independence have been many. There are three reasons that seem to explain this absence. The first reason is the very nature of this conflict. Except those led by Egypt, most wars in independent African countries were civil wars and often wars of secession. This was the case of Nigeria during the Biafra War, the writer Chinua Achebe, Biafra's ambassador during the civil war, could not openly glorify Biafra and its heroes after the war because of the military regime. This was the case also in Uganda, where Alice Lakwena, these fighters of the late 80s, was considered by the government as a rebel tribalist, and that was an obstacle to the diffusion of songs and poems to her glory. The second reason, a corollary of the first one, is that the kind of patriotic fervor leading to the glorification of heroes is more the result of a war against a foreign power. This is the case of the war of October 1973 between Egypt and Israel, or the American bombing on Tripoli and Benghazi in April 1986, assimilated to the fight of David against Goliath. It's similarly the wars of the Horn of Africa gave birth to a poetry full of pain. The third potential reason is the poor commitment of the elite in the struggles of the many wars that Africa has experienced since independence. Poets and writers are probably more inspired by the sacrifices of the over-intellectual, their peers, than the death of unknown peasants. For example, the death of Biafran poet Christopher Okibo, who was on the front line and died on the battlefield during the civil war in Nigeria, provoked more reaction in literary circles than the death of half a million of anonymous youth from Igbo tribe. The Biafra war produced its own Wilfred Owen in the person of Christopher Okibo, but did not see the emergence of a Nigerian or Biafran equivalent of Robert Graves, George Orwell, or Norman Mailer. So the origin of this disenchantment between African writers and soldiers is that, since independence, the military has been more concerned with politics than war. But both have a discordant vision of political life. I actually wonder if the real antagonism is not just between the writers and leaders, be they civil or military. In fact, the case of Muhammad Haikal is a case of point. This very popular Egyptian political writer under Gamal Abdel Nasser ended up in prison under Anwar El Sadat, but his influence on Arab journalism remained immense. In this line of example, the angriest and perhaps the most irrational work is from the Nigerian writer Wole Soyinka. In his book titled The Man Died, he expressed the torment of his detention inflicted by General Gowon, the head of state, and his contempt of the military. And similarly, the Kenyan Nguji Wationgo, who was imprisoned 
by a civilian regime in Kenya made remarks inspired by anger almost as violent as that of Soyinka upon his release from prison. And finally, the most beautiful piece of work in my humble view on this topic is from the Somali novelist Nuruddin Farah, author of a trilogy against military tyranny in his native country. His play, titled Yusuf and His Brothers, is a true story of heroism written against the inhuman horrors of military repression. This play has been a huge success in Nigeria and many other African countries. My African cliché of the day is the silence. Like the forced literary silence of our anonymous heroes, like the guilty silence of intellectual elites, like the still deafening silence of writers, like the silence made of hostility more than veneration. It's also our silence to all in the face of ordinary violence, that of words, that of the suffering of anonymous people, that of the hunger, of sickness today around us. Silence here and there, again and again, for better or for worse. Let's meet again this Thursday for the second part of this literary series and until then, do not remain silent because as Martin Luther King said, at the very end, we do not remember the words of our enemies but the silence of our friends. Thank you and see you on Thursday.